Back in action with exploring distant worlds where our goal continues to be get through the early warp phase of the game as quickly as possible, get the Garax hyperdrives. And we actually have just reached the point where we can start researching them, hyperdrive tech. Now we did just finish the thrust vectors, got some designs ready to be retrofitted to use those. And I'd like to crash this, but well, we don't have nearly enough money gonna have to wait and try to save up some more and also wait for this to gradually get some more progress to lower down the price. Now we have done some exploring. Uguth Tier has something interesting here. We can build a high-tech research bonus research station there. So we've got a construction ship on the way to do that. Of course, we've got better energy and weapons tech going on at the moment. High-tech has been the slowest one, so this will balance that out some. Our construction ship is not going to be able to get there and back under its own fuel. So run out of fuel partly on the way back. But, of course, this is one of those situations. The energy collector is going to help us. And we don't have to shuttle back and forth with freighters for a research station. So that's pretty much the only reason I'm going to get away with doing this. Now, over here in Cidisea, really the only system that we can try to expand to during this early warp phase. Because... It's borderline, probably a little bit marginally too far for our freighters, but I'm going to come in here anyway. We did notice previously that there is a spot to mine some Otandium Opal, one of the luxury resources. And now that we've seen how important those are, let's take a look at our overall stash here. And one element of the interface that I'm not a big fan of is it doesn't give you like whether you're gaining or going down in a resource or how many years to depletion of the amount you currently have or anything of that nature. So you just kind of have to eyeball it and remember what's going on. And with, you know, 40 resources, that's kind of hard to do. But we can notice here that, okay, Ocelia, our one outpost of that is beginning to lower this price. It was at 1.8. And then we get down here into the luxuries. We have none with over 2,000. That's the Equation Incense, Norfidium Ale. We are bringing in that little bit of Natarin Incense from our home system in Curvis, same spot as the Ocelia is at. But then that's the only luxury resource that we can actually produce at the moment. And some of these are lower down. You don't use a lot of luxury resources. It varies based on your population. Ours is gradually growing. But you can see if we were to start to lose some of these, we'd get in some real trouble in terms of being able to have actually, you know, the 10 luxury resources always coming in that we're going to want. So being able to add the Otanium Opal is really going to help us. And we're eventually going to want to expand. You need to ship off some of your resources to other colonies when you do that. So we're going to want to have a stash built up. We don't know what other luxury resources we're going to be able to get. So basically, as soon as possible, we just want to be able to get all of them that we can. In the meantime, though, I want to take a look at some design issues for the military side. Specifically, we just recently have acquired the last of the second tier, if you will, weapon systems. And so let's take a look what we might want to do here in this early warp period. I'm just going to name this ship the early warp frigate. And we need to make a bunch of adjustments here because we haven't done any redesigning on this since we ran into the giant Kaltors. So let's knock off our directional thrusters. We can see that the thrust vectors only need to use half as many, so three of these will be sufficient. We haven't added any shields, and it's actually an open question whether we even should. What are we going to want to use these ships for is a key question. And a lot of it would be potentially fighting space monsters, or it could potentially be fighting some pirates during this phase. Not really going to be fighting other full-fledged civilizations or empires. You know, a significant focus on... Space monsters might not be a bad idea, and they are not going to care about our shields. So you could argue, just leave it off, I'm going to put one on. And that's it. Now we're going to take off these, because these are now outdated weapons. And what do we want to do here? Well, the various weapon systems, we have assault pods, which are a little bit more useful later. It is a lot of fun to capture enemy ships. You can see the shield penetration value here. They do need to have low shields or they won't function, as you can see up here in the description. We are not really going to be in a position to capture a lot of enemy ships yet, though, I don't think. And then if we move down here to some of the others, obviously, you know, the fighter bays and all of that, we're not going to be utilizing those just yet. But 
I think early on, really, what we're looking for is just how can we best utilize our limited space? And I think a useful metric sort of look at is energy divided by time divided by the amount of space. So basically, what's the most efficient output of damage per unit of space that you're going to have? And if we look at the Maxos Blaster, the beam weapon category that we mentioned before, well, this is going to do about four damage a second. Again, it's going to be low range. So it's going to have the damage loss per distance. We're going to want to be right next to the enemy ships if possible. And then, okay, unit size of five for the weapon. Then if we look at the rail guns, and that's probably the other primary contender along with the beam weapons. They do just about the same amount of damage, actually slightly more uh, damage per second per unit of space. Only one second fire rate. They don't lose any with distance, but they need to be pretty close anyway. Again, only 120 range. The energy usage we actually don't care about. And the reason we don't care about it is because we're using so much energy to power our warp drives. There's no room on the ship sizes that we can build right now to cram enough weapons in to use all of that energy when we're not using the warp drive. So it's just not an issue until later. And we'll revisit the weapon comparisons further on in the game. Once that actually balances out some, what you want to use at different stages does change. Now, a lot of people do say, hey, you should really go for the rail guns early. They do have some negatives, though, as well. They've got the 10% targeting negative. They partially bypass shields. So if you want to capture a bunch of enemy ships with the assault pods, you probably wouldn't want to go as hard into these because they're not going to be knocking down those shields for you. And they're less effective against armor. Well, that's going to matter a lot more against pirates than it will against space monsters. So again, what are you going to be fighting? Or, of course, against other empires as well as the pirates. And I really think you go either way with the Maxos Blaster or the Railgun in terms of which one would be the best at this point. I'm going to go with the versatility, though, and I'm going to stick with the Maxos Blasters. But again, both of these are short range. So we have others like the Intimidator Surge Wave, Intimidator Surge Wave. Okay, I mean, its damage is not spectacular, but it's per ship. It's an area effect. So if you had as many as four nearby ships, then this would be more effective than the other weapons. But these are usually for large battles. You can often mount them on stations. Again, that's not the kind of thing that we're leaning into here. We're looking at skirmishes here. And so we're not really going to want to go with that at this point. The Graviton Beam. Well... Another short-ranged weapon, you can see it has significant power loss over time, it fires pretty slow, it ignores shields and armor completely. And so this is one that I think is really good in theory, not so much in practice when you combine everything together. If it had longer range, I can see maybe it being more effective, but the overall damage, raw damage that is, is much lower than anything else. It kind of has to be given its ability to bypass defenses. I can see where it would be effective if you had an enemy that had just tons of really good defenses and you just didn't really have a good way to get through them. But if you're facing that kind of an enemy, the chances that you're going to be able to get in close enough range to use this effectively just aren't there, in my opinion. So I just don't think it practically really works very well. And you can see also, you know, part of the whole reason it's not a great damage option is look at the size of it. We'd be lucky to fit one of these on our current ships. Okay, and then we've upgraded from the Seeking Missile to the Concussion Missile, which importantly is the only effective long-range weapon at this point. And this is the reason why I'm going to advocate putting them on. Its range is 520, our Seeking Missile only 400. You know, these are gradual improvements. And overall damage rate, it's less than a third of what the Maxos Blaster or the Railgun is going to give you. But it does have that ability to fire from distance and that's what you're getting them for and also no damage loss again they are less effective against armor so they do definitely come with their drawbacks but when you have no other long range option you take the one that you have and not worry about it too much now on the surface the epsilon torpedo appears to be more of a medium range weapon but if you look at the damage loss this fires from maximum range it does almost nothing the effective damage here very similar to the concussion missile if it is actually able to hit for maximum damage, which means it's got to be at point-blank range. And if we're going to have something be at point-blank range, why don't we take something that's more effective there, 
that is the Maxos Blaster Railgun. So that's basically the way that I would assess the early game weapon systems. And I'm going to have the one missile then. And then as many Maxos Blasters as I can cram on, which I believe is just going to be the two here. So two blasters, one missile. We've still got the shields. We've still got our armor. We're pretty much going to stick where we are with the rest of this. And I think this is about as good as I can do. Now, I don't like doing like a bunch of multiple different designs, especially at this point in the game. But in general, if you can really want to try to multitask and plan things out, that is an option. But let's say I built concussion missile ships and then I also built Maxos blaster ships and had them mixed up. Well, if you have your ships move around, all of a sudden maybe you're getting hit in one location by something that you really want your long-range ships for, but they happen to be off somewhere else. It's just too easy to get into difficult situations like that. I think it's a lot more sensible just to have a good all-around design that maybe isn't great at anything, but is prepared for all circumstances. That just seems to work out a lot better for me. So, we are going to do a bunch of retrofitting then. We are going to, let's see... Now, you are currently on your way to build the research station, but everybody else is not. So all of you need to retrofit up to the latest design, which you have not done yet. Of course, our exploration ships are out doing their thing. I don't need to retrofit them. Let's switch to our military. And all of you are going to come in to be the early warp frigate okay and then at this point i also want to save a little bit of money by getting rid of our two derelicts the royal guard fleet okay so you are going to retire and we're going to get whatever tech bonus we can from you i'm just sort of waiting to do this until all of them are ready and there's the other one that's been just sort of hanging around waiting. And now that we're upgrading our military ships, they should be able to handle system defense for us. And we can get rid of these. We now have the Ravager of Kerbus retiring. And that whole process basically just works in reverse of when you build them. The unbuilt components goes up and up instead of down and down. Meanwhile, we have gotten some of the construction ships retrofitted. So we're just going to use this option for sending them out there we are conspicuous rover you can go grab our tandem opal and the other two can just sort of hang out here as we wait to see what we're going to get from these retiring ships down to 37 unbuilt and boom there it goes we get a research bonus in enhanced commerce which I think is down here. Yep. So that'll be our upgrade to the Commerce Center, giving us a little bit more of a trade bonus when we do eventually move up to researching that. And you can see by the percentages there, it gives us about 100K, and it's basically random which project it'll give you. So I find a lot of times, we're probably not gonna wanna get this one for a while. It isn't that beneficial, but it's better than getting nothing. Then let's see where we are with the other one. It's just coming in here. And now it's starting to rack up its unbuilt components. This, of course, is the ship that's going off to build the research station. And it's giving us that message because it has gotten out of fuel range to get back to refuel. But it'll be fine. Larger ship, taking a little bit longer. Okay, improved logistics. And interestingly enough, that actually is going to give us the whole thing. That's a bit better bonus that we're going to get from that ship. 
So now we don't have to research that maintenance cost at all. We're just going to skip over that entire tech. So that's not a bad little bonus for us. And at this point, we just have nothing really to do but wait for all of our exploring to go. And more importantly, to continue working this down so that we can afford to accelerate this. The gap has gotten closer, but there is quite a ways yet to go. Jumping forward almost a year to late 2106. We have some more decisions to make here. We have finished the research station in Uguth Tier, and also the mining station in Sidisea. We can see our ships making their way back. We've got plenty of fuel for the conspicuous rover, but the Kerbis Dawn sort of limping its way around. And now that we have that up, we now have bonuses in all three of our fields, as expected, and up over 200k for a high tech, so that's nice. Quarter of the way here, and if we try to advance, well, we still don't have enough money. Now, one of our exploration ships has run into a situation here in Calcetu. Latest exploration, there's some ruins in this system, but they have encountered an Artilus. A new type of space creature. And as we try to jump away from it, we discover that doesn't work out very well. Because the Artilus has the ability to have some type of hyperspace travel. It's the only space creature that can do that. You can see they're very sizable. 700 plus health. Lots of size. They're not that strong and they're not that fast. They're just beefy and have the hyper travel capability. So we're going to be stuck here just sort of trying to escape from it. And I'm going to want to come back to this system later. Very nice. So now even better in weapons research we are. So we are running away here. And I'm going to go and explore another system. Since we're not really going to be able to evade the Artilus. But I'm going to want to come back to Kalsatu. Definitely. To get the other items we need to investigate including the ruins. So how do we know that this is a system we have to return to? Because you're given the name of it once you start exploring it, but we're not actually finished here. Well, if we use the editor, I'm just going to change the name. To let me know, look, there's an Artilus here, and we have unfinished business. There we go. And then we also need to consider what we're going to do on the research front. We have just begun the third tier in weapons with ion weapons. And we're going to be moving on to some others, tractor beams, etc. that we do not have any versions of just yet. So going for the new items first. And then we're about to finish resource exploration here, which is going to give us longer range for our sensors. Really helps a lot in speeding up the surveying process. But then I need to decide whether I want to dive into colonization, which will allow us to colonize planets of our native type, in this case, the continental. But there are other options that are much cheaper. We could go forward, structured research, to get more scientists over time, you know, reduce our maintenance, various storage items, etc. And I kind of could go either direction on this. It takes quite a while to build up colony ships. I just think it's worth getting this in case we find some good options. We don't know if we're going to or not. This is just sort of a speculative pick, but I don't feel right leaving this behind anymore. So we are going to jump into this, and this will take, just like the Garrix hyperdrives, it's going to take years to research. So we're just going to have to be pretty patient with it. Another year forward, and we now have enough cash to start this moving a little bit faster. So... Our crash program is going to cost us 123k. We're going to go ahead and spend it. Now that means it's going to take less than a year. We're going to save probably a little over a year's time to get the Garax hyperdrive. And I'm not going to be maneuvering my exploration ships into any more systems. We have a couple of them that are coming back to retrofit and refuel now. They're just going to hang out here. A couple more. They'll just finish up the systems they're currently working on. And then they'll need to come back. And a couple other items worth noting. We have explored some systems like this one that are, don't have an actual real name, just NC-17 there, or there's UC-465 here. What happens with those is they are systems with nothing in them. They just have a star, there's no planets, there's no usable resources, there's just the star and nothing else. So you get that sort of alphanumeric designation, and if they don't get that, you get something more like Almanea or whatever, then we know that there is potentially 
something useful available. Now, we're not going to have time in this episode to go a whole bunch into it, but we did actually have one of the pirates sell our information to uh, actual Empire. So we now have met our first rival, the Utrantu Collective. We can see they are Buscar, which is an insectoid type of race. You can see their characteristics here, etc. They're, <laughs> they're not very friendly. Everybody always starts out distrusting you. They like our government type, though, so that's helping us. And this starts at negative 25, the ignorance penalty, and it's gradually going up. But we don't even know where these are. We do know that their population and their tax revenue, etc., is significantly less than ours. So these are not a significant threat. And it was suggested by our advisors that we conduct an espionage message against them. I'm actually not going to do that simply because I'm going to wait for some more information and I don't consider them a threat. So I'd like to just wait and get to know them a little bit more first. We also are starting to feel the pain economically because our cash flow, if anything, is declining slightly due to the number of pirates that we've met and needed to sign protection agreements with. You can see that we do have quite a few of them around. So that's going to start to become more and more of an issue, but again, that's just another reason to push forward to the Garex hyperdrive so we can get through that and be able to actually deal with the pirates. That's going to be coming up soon. We're going to be looking to some more diplomacy options. We're going to want to take a closer look at some of the racial details and what are the victory conditions, how does all of that interaction with other empires work. All of that's going to be much more relevant to us now that we are going to be moving forward with faster warp travel. But in the interest of sort of walking before we run, we are going to be working on expanding our spaceport again and doing everything we can to prepare for the jump to Garrick's hyperdrives. And we'll resume that process when we come back. So thanks for watching, everybody. An exciting time upon us in Distant Worlds as we're about to make the jump to the next phase of the game. And I hope you join me when that resumes. See you then.